Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm super excited to be able to talk with you. Uh, for those of you that I haven't had the chance to meet, um, I'm Kristen Bargnano. I am a child neurologist and neurogeneticist. I'm based in Baltimore, Maryland. I see patients at Hopkins and at Kennedy Krieger. And for the past few years, I've been part of the multidisciplinary aging and hernia delang syndrome a clinic uh, run by Dr. Tony Klein at Greater Baltimore Medical Center. And so I uh, was uh, fortunate enough to uh, receive a foundation grant uh, to look at the specific question of SMC1A uh, mutations in epilepsy. And I'll give you a little bit of background about how I initially became interested in this. And so this is the same presentation that I gave at the end of in Minneapolis uh, at the uh, CDLS uh, scientific meeting. Okay, uh, let's see. I hear from Greg Fenton that there's uh, someone's chiming in. A lot of background noise can participate. Can can you make sure that you're on mute uh, if if you're um, if you're listening to the webinar? Okay. All right. So let's see. Here we are. So just a back a little bit of background. Cornelia de Lange syndrome. I think everyone is familiar with. Um, it's a genetic syndrome with very distinctive facial features. Uh, and it's characterized by growth uh, restriction, uh, hairiness or hirsutism, upper limb anomalies, and a range of intellectual abilities, uh, but very frequent behavioral issues, including self-injurious behavior. So Cornelia de Lange syndrome, or CDLS, is a clinical diagnosis. There are many children who have a diagnosis of CDLS without genetic testing, um, but having a positive mutation in one of the genes associated with CDLS uh, right now is sufficient uh, to make the diagnosis. Um, in terms of the clinical criteria, uh, we are uh, the primary cl uh, clinical criteria include the facial features uh, of CDLS, which include very distinctive arched eyebrows that meet at the midline, something we, the medical term is synophorous, um, and then three or more of a number of other uh, common findings, including very long eyelashes, a short nose with upturned nostrils, uh, small or square chin, um, widely spaced teeth. And then if you meet the facial criteria, there are then a combination of major criteria or major and minor criteria, including issues with growth, development, or behavior. Um, let's see. Let me get my slides to advance. So this is just a panel uh, illustrating some of the uh, 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 patients with CDLS in terms of you can appreciate the range of their um, facial features. So right now there are seven genes that are associated with CDLS. Uh, the most common one is NIPBL, uh, but these other ones, RAD21, SMC3, HDAC8, and SMC1A, and then two newer genes, ANKRD11 and BRD4. And what these genes all have in common is they are components of what's called the cohesin complex. And so the cohesin complex is an assembly of proteins that's job is to package our DNA into chromatin, it was called chromatin. And so, uh, so organisms that have uh, significant mutations in any of these components have trouble packaging their DNA. They can't undergo cell division appropriately. Uh, and generally, uh, some of these mutations are very lethal. Um, however, we know that the cohesion uh, complex is also probably is also important in controlling gene expression. And so sometimes changes in one of these components relates to causes downstream changes in gene expression that causes the manifestation of a syndrome like CDLS. And SMC1A is specifically part of the structure um, of one of the structural components of the cohesin ring that gathers together uh, the, the DNA material. So SMC1A stands for Structural Maintenance of Chromosomes 1A. Um, it's a reasonably sized gene. It has about 20, it has 25 exons, and it has about 1,200 amino acids. We know that it lives on the X chromosome, so that girls have two copies of SMC1A uh, because they have two X chromosomes, and boys who have an X and a Y chromosome only have one copy of, of this gene. So genes that reside on the X chromosome can undergo a process of something called X inactivation. Uh, we know that in each uh, cell for a female, one X chromosome preferentially gets turned off so that in general, those genes are not active. But the conventional wisdom up to this point has been that SMC1A escapes X inactivation and so that both copies um, in girls are active.
Okay, so SMC1A was first identified as a cause of Cornelia de Lange syndrome in 2006. Uh, this group led by Antonio Musio et al. identified two families in Italy um, who had clinic, met clinical criteria for CDLS, um, and then when they did the, the DNA sequencing, found the changes in what was then called SMC1L1. Um, and you can see that uh, the mother is in panel C, um, and then her boys are panel A, B, and E, um, and they have the arched eyebrows, and they had some issues including intellectual disability, and then panel D is another family. Uh, Matthew Deerdorf's group looked also at the question of patients who had a clinical diagnosis of CDLS but did not have NIPBL mutations. Remember, NIPBL is the most common cause of CDLS, and found that 10 of those patients had SMC1A variants. So this is what leads to us estimating that about 5% of the cases of CDLS are caused by SMC1A changes. In general, uh, the patients who are identified uh, with SMC1A mutations are both boys and girls, um, and they are more mildly affected than classical CDLS, um, including they tend to be mild, more mildly affected intellectually and in terms of their limb anomalies. And so in terms of, all, at that point, all of the uh, SMC1A patients had been identified. They were skewed a little more female, uh, a range of severity. Um, and then these tended to be what are called missense mutations or in-frame deletions, meaning when the gene is spelled out, um, one amino acid gets substituted for another and the rest of the protein is not affected so that the protein can be made just with that substitution. Um, and, uh, and that's distinctive from, from your girls in terms of your girls tending to have what are called truncating mutations, and we'll get to that in just a moment. Um, in general, with this group of SMC1A patients, epilepsy was not a significant issue. When we talk about epilepsy and CDLS, estimates are that up to 25% of patients with classical CDLS have epilepsy, but in general, the seizures come under control easily and are often outgrown, so it doesn't tend to be a huge issue. So the inspiration for this study was this patient, Katie, who lives in Pennsylvania. Um, she, uh, when I was in training, she was having very severe clusters of seizures and would frequently get transported to us at Hopkins and got to know the family quite well. And so we're quite surprised when she finally had the opportunity to have whole exome sequencing performed. Uh, we found out that she had a variant in SMC1A uh, since we had not had any clinical suspicion of Cornelia de Lange syndrome prior to that being uh, found. And so it was around this time that a number of groups had made the same kind of observation that there seemed to be girls who had uh, SMC1A mutations, uh, very severe epilepsy that tended to cluster, um, and then also tending to have uh, mutations that would be very detrimental to the production of the gene, so what we call um, nonsense or truncating mutations. So uh, with uh, in collaboration with Dr. Klein at GPMC, we uh, wanted to explore um, in more detail these specific group of girls with SMC1A mutations in, in, in epilepsy and to see what we could learn about the relationship between the gene change and, and the epilepsy. So, uh, so we were able to recruit 13 families uh, through uh, their treating clinicians from outreach from the CDLS Foundation and uh, the SMC1A Facebook group was a huge part of this, uh, being able to bring all of you guys together. Um, and then 13 uh, families traveled over two clinics uh, to Baltimore to be seen at GBMC, and there they met with a number of subspecialists to talk about different concerns, um, and then also underwent a standardized uh, genetic exam and neurologic exam and an interview about their epilepsy. In addition, we reviewed all of the records that were available that you guys had uh, just shared with us. So in terms of the demographics of, of the 13 girls and families who were able to come, um, you can see that uh, there was a range. Not surprisingly, uh, most of the girls were on the young side, uh, just uh, because of the nature of the type of testing that uh, led to the diagnosis. Uh, whole exome sequencing uh, was what led to the diagnosis for most of the girls, um, and that's really only been available clinically for six or seven years. And so, really, you know, the younger girls are the ones who are right in the thick of the initial investigations, meeting with geneticists, and being offered this testing. Um, and then, oftentimes with older children who have these issues, it takes a while for them to circle back to the geneticist to see what new tests are available um, to try and answer the question of what's the underlying uh, diagnosis or reason for the neurologic issues. 
And these are our girls who were able to come. Um, so there are 13 girls total. Uh, everybody who's on can pick out your girl. Um, and we're going to go through the pictures in a little more detail to discuss some of the similarities that we feel that we see um, in their facial appearances and how that relates to CDLS. So with this uh, group of, with our group of girls, uh, there was actually only one girl who had a clinical suspicion of CDLS prior to the testing being sent. Um, and that was here in the upper left hand corner. Um, and so, uh, and then this is the panel that shows all of the changes that were found. Um, so the patient, patients are numbered one through 13. Um, and then the variant, um, essentially the variant, when it was tested, was able to be tested, was always brand new in, in the girl, uh, never inherited from a mother or a father. Um, and then in terms of the predicted ef effect, uh, overwhelmingly, uh, there are a couple of, there are three that had, were predicted to be what are called missense changes. So it's just kind of a substitution of one amino acid for another, but for the remainder were all these nonsense and truncating mutations. So the idea is that if you kind of garble the rest of the genes sufficiently, this process of called nonsense mediated decay occurs uh, so that the protein is just not produced. And so, uh, so there's likely a, an underlying difference in terms of what happens molecularly for girls who have SMC1A epilepsy probably have uh, reduced, may have reduced levels of SMC1A production as part of the process of what's going on. Um, so uh, we also looked at what are called what's called X inactivation. So because the conventional wisdom has been that SMC1A escapes X inactivation, you would predict based on that that everyone would have random X inactivation. It wouldn't matter which gene got turned off since both of them are supposed to be expressed. But what we found is about half of the girls actually were moderately or highly skewed. So that does give us some indication that it probably does undergo some degree of X inactivation. Um, however, at this point, we really haven't been able to find a link between uh, the degree of X inactivation and how severe uh, someone's seizures are or how significant their developmental disabilities are. And that may be just the limitations of this testing because different uh, tissues can have different degrees of skewing because when we're testing from the blood or saliva, we're not necessarily getting a, an exact snapshot of what's going on in the brain in terms of the amount of skewing. In terms of meeting clinical criteria, when Dr. Klein objectively looked at things like for uh, sinophorus or arched eyebrows that met in the middle or described noses and the like, there were three girls who met clinical criteria based on their facial features uh, for CDLS. Um, and this is largely on the basis of their eyebrows, their nose, uh, having long eyelashes, and one of the other features. Um, in total, though, there were eight girls that were described that Dr. Klein felt had the arched eyebrows. Um, um, and that also had one or two minor criteria, mostly long eyelashes and then some of the other things. Um, and then we'll put everybody back together again so you can see them all. Um, and so the overall conclusion is that we did feel that there was an overall uh, gestalt in terms of the appearance of the girls, in terms of ways they look similar to each other. Um, and what we uh, describe is the distinctive eyebrow arch, them tending to have long eyelashes, um, and then prominent uh, supraorbital ridges um, and somewhat shallow orbits, uh, tending to have a normal philtrum, uh, which is the area between the nose and the upper lip, uh, which tends to be longer and smoother in CDLS. Um, and in contrast to classical CDLS, uh, tended to have a small mouth, uh, have a well-formed lips, which is different. Uh, you can't appreciate it from the pictures, but many of the girls had somewhat low set and small, uh, uh, somewhat small and posteriorly rotated ears and tended to have long tapered fingers. Um, <laughs> In terms of the develop, developmental criteria for CDLS, um, 12 of the 13 girls are uh, significantly affected in terms of being nonverbal or having at most a few words or signs. Um, the one girl who's an exception is patient eight. Um, and so what's a little bit different about her genetic testing is that her change is almost at the very end of the gene. Um, it's in exon um, 24. And so the thinking is that when a change happens that uh, far into the gene, uh, that it may um, es escape the process of nonsense mediated decay and allow higher levels of expression of the protein. So that may be the link of so why she, she is somewhat, has somewhat higher functioning. Um, and then uh, almost ha about half, a little less than half the girls are ambulatory. Um, 
in, t in general, and when you look at criteria for behavioral issues, five of the 13 girls, the families did report they had some issues which were typically mild aggression or self-injurious behavior. But in general, behavior was not a significant issue the way it is more with classical CDLS. Uh, but in terms of looking at other criteria, um, growth was an issue for many of the girls. Nine out of 13 were less than the fifth percentile for their weight, height, or head circumference. Um, and many of the girls had very small hands and feet. Uh, what other things that were common were very frequent urinary tract infections or kidney anomalies, and very, very frequent to have feeding issues requiring a gastrostomy tube. So in terms of our conclusions, uh, first the SMC1A epilepsy girls have some facial features in common with classical CDLS, but have a distinctive overall gestalt. Developmentally, essentially all the girls are profoundly affected, um, but SMC ep SMC1A epilepsy girls do share a number of common issues with classical CDLS, including growth, GI feeding, and GU issues, uh, which leads to us to the conclusion uh, that it is very reasonable for us to continue to think of this under the umbrella of the kind of CDLS spectrum in terms of being beneficial to comparing uh, strategies and uh, treatments for some of the other issues, although, of course, the epilepsy is very distinct, and we're going to turn to that next in the next few minutes. Before I move on to talk about the epilepsy, um, does anybody have any questions or input right now? Can you chime in with the chat? Okay. Um, so in terms of the seizures, uh, it looks like we only have, um, we're running down on the meeting time, but um, uh, early onset of seizures, essentially all of the girls had seizures that started before age two. Uh, when the seizures started, initially there wasn't necessarily a clue that something was different or that these seizures were going to be so difficult to control. In general, when the girls had their initial EEGs, those EEGs were normal or just had some, uh, some multifocal spikes. Um, it was very rare. Only one girl actually had a diagnosis of infantile spasms, which is a very particular type of seizure with uh, particular EEG findings. And so most girls were started on you know, either Keppra or Phenobarbital or sometimes Topamash which would all be very uh, common initial seizure medications. Uh, essentially, all of the girls would go undergo MRI to try and understand why they were having seizures and having developmental delay issues at that point. Um, and there were no specific findings, nothing that would clue us in uh, that to be thinking about SMC1A epilepsy. Uh, there was one patient who had uh, missing the the fiber bundle that connects the two hemispheres, the corpus callosum, um, and then one patient had a Chiari-1 malformation, but these are very common things to find in syndromes outside of SMC1A. What does tend to be most reliably going along with this disorder are recurrent clustering of seizures, oftentimes provoked in the setting of illness. And as you guys are very well aware, uh, very common to have episodes of prolonged status epilepticus requiring emergency room visits and sometimes hospitalizations. Um, unfortunately, regression often in the setting of seizure clusters is very common. It's reported in eight of the 13 girls who came as part of the study. Um, and some of the girls were seemed to be developing normally prior to the onset of seizures and then regressing, but many of the girls also had some preceding developmental delays. Um, however, you know, this is definitely a uh, something that makes me feel like we want to make this diagnosis as early as possible so that before um, we have the opportunity to work on seizure control and potentially, you know, have some degree of a better developmental outcome. Uh, this is uh, talking about all the different anti-epileptics that have been tried, uh, looking at uh, girls who report having tried medications. Um, Okay. Oh, great. We've got some extra time. Super. Uh, thank you, Francesca. Um, and so, um, uh, so uh, I'll go through the abbreviations at the bottom. These are all be medications that you're very familiar with. Um, so essentially, most of the girls have been tried on Keppra, which is levetiracetam. Um, most people had tried topiramate or topamax. Many had tried phenobarbital. Uh, CLB is clobazam or onfi. Um, Oh, the oxcarb and carbamazepine are trileptal and tegretol, uh, lamotrigine, lacosamide or vimpat, clonazepam, uh, valproate or depakote, 
zanisamide, gabapentin or pregabalin, which are uh, which is Lyrica, and then uh, just a couple of girls had tried on rafinamide or phenytoin. Uh, so you can see there are a large number of medications that have been tried, and you know my hope had been initially when we proposed this study that we would find uh, some clarity in terms of the certain combinations of medications uh, clearly being superior or people having better seizure control on them, but in general, um, essentially, um, uh, the, the vast majority of the girls, you know, despite all of these seizure medication trials, are still having very co poorly controlled seizures. Um, the exception being one or two girls who are on uh, rather complicated regimens of multiple medications, and I'll talk more about that at the end. Okay. Um, so in terms of going through the numbers, the average number of conventional trials of AEDs was over six. Uh, you, can, you guys know very well what this is like, you know, the trying a medication, ramping up the dosage, coming to the conclusion that it's not working, um, uh, and, uh, and then switching to a new medication. Uh, so we have a question, were there any meds you thought should have been seen that weren't tried? Um, so yeah, so I'm gonna talk about that at the end a little bit, um, but the, uh, essentially most of the medications in our toolkit that we're familiar with and most pediatric neurologists are gonna feel comfortable using, um, most people have, you know, those are all in the mix. Uh, there are a couple of medications that probably are only gonna be pulled out to be used by a pediatric uh, epileptologist who has a lot of familiarity with patients with intractable epilepsy. So for example, I was a little bit surprised that not a single girl was tried on felbamate. Uh, so felbamate is one that in, uh, in adults can cause uh, fulminant liver failure, and so it's a lot of hoops to go through to try felbamate, but that liver failure is essentially never seen in children and can be a very efficacious drug, and no one has been tried on felbamate. Uh, so I was a little bit surprised by that. Uh, so when we talk about the number of medications uh, that people are currently on, the average is smidge over two. Um, and then when we talk about kind of other uh, complementary therapies like ketogenic diet, CBD, and vagal, vagus nerve stimulator, that number goes up to 8.6 agents who have been tried. And when we talk about the number of current interventions, including the ketogenic diet, uh, CBD, and VNS, it goes up to almost three things that people are juggling in their regimens to try and manage the seizures. Okay, the ketogenic diet is very frequently tried. Uh, 10 out of the 13 girls had tried it, though it was really only clearly helpful in two. Um, and there were some girls who had complications or side effects related to the diet. So, you know, it seems like, you know, it's very common for us to refer people for the ketogenic diet when they're having very intractable seizures. Um, I think the expectation should be that it would be reasonable to try if someone has a feeding uh, so that it's reasonably easy to over the formula, um, but especially if your girl is eating by mouth um, and taking her food, and eating, you know, it's a lot of effort to switch over to the ketogenic diet. Um, that would probably be lower on our list of priorities in terms of things to try um, in, in terms of SMC1A epilepsy. The vagus nerve stimulator, um, six of the 13 girls had had one implanted, and it was clearly helpful for half of them. And that really goes along with what we think about the vagus nerve stimulator. The uh, idea is that with the VNS, about half of the people will have a 50% reduction in their seizures. So it's, uh, you know, in, in keeping with what we expect in terms of the effectiveness of the VNS. Um, so it's not exceptionally, um, not exceptional improvement, but not resistant to the VNS. Um, so, so certainly the VNS is something that you know, you have at least a 50% chance of a 50% reduction in seizures. Um, so definitely um, an option. CBD is obviously a very hot topic these days, um, and eight of the 13 girls have tried CBD, um, and as, as of the time of the end of the study, six of the 13 were currently on it, um, and because of perceived benefit in terms of uh, their seizure control. Uh, there was one girl who uh, had some benefits in terms of her behavior, but not necessarily seizure control, um, but didn't stay on it um, because of that. 
Uh, so we know that there are lots of issues with CBD in terms of not just the legality and the, the hoops to go through to get it, but in terms of the you know preparation and the concentration and trying to titrate it up as a more conventional medication. And so we're all very interested in the fact that Epidiolex um, has been approved by the FDA, but it is not yet available for us to prescribe. Um, but that's going to be a more standardized way to try CBD therapy for our patients. So in terms of specific recommendations for seizure management, um, you know, I think that uh, in terms of rational combination therapy, uh, that would be something that you would continue to work with, with your child neurologist or epileptologist. One combination I felt was a little bit underutilized that's been very helpful uh, in patients with intractable epilepsy is the combination of valproic acid or Depakote with Lamotrigine or Lamictal. Uh, those two medications have very synergistic effects, and I was a little surprised by how few people, uh, few, how few of the girls were on that combination. Uh, although I know anecdotally from, you you know, involvement in the uh, Facebook site that many girls have experienced some side effects related to that, to the valproate in particular, so that may limit the use. Um, another very significant, uh, power, a potentially powerful combination is the combination of lacosamide plus clob clobazam, so Vimpat plus Onfi. Uh, so many of the girls who have been tried on Onfi, many of them are staying on it because it seems to be helpful, and I'd be very interested to see if adding Vimpat to the regimen would be helpful. Um, I think everyone is going to be very eager to consider Epidiolex once it's available, but there are going to be obviously um, difficulties with any of these new medications. They're going to be very expensive and there are going to be um, um, insurance companies are going to push back. Um, and because the indication for the Epidiolex, they're getting approval because of uh, the work that's done with intractable epilepsies due to like SCN1A and Dravet syndrome. Um, and it, in, in a lot of insurance companies are going to be pushing back if people don't have that specific diagnosis that the FDA approval was based on. Uh, based on uh, and the general experience with the VNS, I think it'd be very reasonable to pursue that earlier rather than later, uh, that we can ex expect reasonable effect. And I didn't specifically mention it, um, but for the girls that are starting to go through puberty, many of them start to have clusters of seizures around their menstrual cycles. And for a couple of the girls, progesterone therapy has been very helpful with that. And so that's something that I definitely would want to consider everyone to consider upon starting puberty uh, to help with better control of seizures. Um, going forward, um, I think it's going to be really important to follow uh, your girls as they get older to understand what challenges or issues may arise uh, with the future. I do know uh, that a couple of the girls, of the older girls, have developed some spasticity or tightness um, that, that needs to be managed with physical therapy and with potential medication or Botox. So that might be something we need to be aware of and on top of going into the future. And certainly monitoring for any other complications that might be I'm going to pause there um, because those are all the specific slides that I have. Um, but I'd like to uh, open it up for input or questions. Uh, if there's anything that um, you guys is on your mind that you'd like to talk about. Um, so, a question. Are there any other researchers on SMC1A going on currently? Any done outside the U.S.? Um, so, uh, excellent question. Um, so, there are many uh, people who are uh, studying SMC1A in uh, model organisms, so things like in uh, Drosophila and mice um, that are kind of um, uh, you know, studying the basic cell biology of what SMC1A does. And I think what's going to be really important is to bridge that gap between the clinical side and the people who are in the bench. The bench. So we want to bring the bedside to the bench so that we can see, you know, for example, are there medications that can maybe um, affect the levels of SMC1A and affect and improve seizure control if we could raise SMC1A levels, for example. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. And so comment, my daughter had normal development the first year of life. How do you explain that if there can be an explanation? So I think the best way to, you know, think about this is we know that um, in terms of we think of SMC1A controlling gene regulation in terms of how genes get turned on and genes get turned off. 
And so we know that there are developmental windows when certain genes are important. Um, so, uh, so it's not uncommon with other genetic disorders to see a period of normal development before the, the role that that gene kind of plays kind of kicks in, um, and then you start having the problem. So I think the best analogy would probably be to Rett syndrome. Uh, the gene involved in Rett syndrome is called MECP2 or MECP2, which is a transcriptional regulator, so it also controls gene expression. And in general, most of the, many of the girls with Rett syndrome show initially normal development for the first year, year and a half of life before they start regressing and having seizures. So I think it's, it has to do with kind of this developmental program of gene expression that SMC1A is related to. Okay, somebody, uh, somebody was asking a question through the microphone and I, I couldn't hear them. Could you either uh, do it in the group chat or speak up again? Okay, I'm sorry, I still can't hear you. Okay. Um, so from my perspective going forward, um, you know, I really want to uh, publish this research um, so that it can be out there in the literature for all the doctors who take care of girls with SMC1A to review and um, um, uh, and, uh, and be available to them. So oh, here, uh, are you familiar with this study that can be effective for SMC1A? Let me click on which link you're talking about and see which pops up here. Um, a perspective on a cure for Rett syndrome. Um, so, um, so I'm not familiar with it. I have not had the opportunity to read this article. Um, it looks like it just came out pretty recently. Um, but, uh, but obviously there's been a lot of interest in regulating MECP2 um, in terms of controlling gene expression, and that will certainly be um, a field of study that we'll want to follow and see if this could potentially um, be applicable to, to your girls for sure. Okay. How do you type to ask a question? Uh, so, so if you look, uh, there's a chat, uh, chat function. Um, if you go, uh, at least for me, when you go under more, it says chat, and then the chat window will pop up. If you can see my screen. But I, I could hear you well enough if you want to ask your question. Um, how many patients do you know with SMC1A that also have um, semi-lobar holoprosencephaly? Um, so, so, one. <laughs> I don't. I don't know of. I don't know of any others. And so the question then is: Is it possible that there, for your daughter, there's more than one thing going on? Um, because sometimes we do run across people who have two reasons for their neurologic issues, um, rather than it necessarily being part of the specific SMC1A epilepsy syndrome. Okay, yeah. it looks like someone's also chiming in to say you can click Alt H to answer to enter a question. Mm -hmm. But I also think, you know, going forward, it would be really nice uh, if we can, you know, so some of the observations that we were able to make for your 13 girls who came for the study, um, you know, given the power of the, you know, Facebook group, if we could potentially design some, you know, a sur survey type questions um, so that we can, you know, get a bigger sense of like, well, of all of the families who are affiliated with the SMC1A Facebook group, you know, how many of them have tried the ketogenic diet and how many of them find that it's effective to make sure that we're not drawing conclusions incorrectly based on a relatively small size of the group. It says, what question, what interventions do you recommend regarding overall development? Is there any data 
or conclusions about what's effective. So in terms of interventions over, regarding overall development, um, I think the question is really going to be, you know, if we can identify girls early in terms of understanding why they have SMC1A, uh, the, why they have intractable epilepsy, if we can come up and figure out what's going to be the best regimen for controlling their seizures, will that have ultimately an impact on their development? I, I don't know, um, but I would be, be potentially be an avenue to explore. Um, you know, right now, the interventions, including early intervention like PT, OT, speeches are all very standard, um, but I would be really very interested in, you know, pulling the group in terms of the group's experience with adaptive communication and eye gaze techniques, uh, because we know that many girls will have much better receptive language uh, than, than they're able to show with their expressive language and see if this is something that can uh, be a good tool to help the girls express themselves better. Do you know of any other patients that are on FICOMPA? Um, so, so no. So, so FICOMPA is the one is one of the newer medications uh, that has not been widely tried um, in SNC one A, and so that would certainly be a one uh, in addition to like rifinamide and felbamate um, that we certainly you know can explore, especially in combination with other medications. We're on FICOMPA, but I don't know if we're treating seizures because of the SMC1A or the holoprosencephaly. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, so in terms of the you know ones that people try, it's it's one that is tends to be much lower down on the list of medications um, uh, that people have tried. Um, oh, we have we have input here. Our daughters tried FICOMPA and it was not effective. So there's there's one one more input. Thank you. Out of the medications that you've listed, we are on, I think, five of them, four of them. Okay. Which, which are, you, are you guys on right now? We are on um, Keppra, Onfi, Depakine, or Depakote, mm -hmm. um, Ficampa, and then she's also on Gabapentin, but the Gabapentin is being used to treat like her mood and not necessarily the seizures. Okay, and, and do you think her mood issues are a side effect of the medication, or you think you know that she's just generally having issues? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? You broke up a little so, bit. So, so uh, do you think that her mood is is it irritability that she's having, or you know, do you think that's a side effect of medications, or do you think that that's just her? Um, I think it's probably a combination of the medications and uh, just. A little bit of her. <laughs> okay. Get another input. So this is a second person saying that they tried Ficomp and it wasn't effective. Okay. Um, and how how are your seizure, your daughter's seizures generally doing with that combination right now? Um, right now we're doing okay. We were having like multiple a day. She's never been like a, she's never had seizures for like days on end, but she has clustered. Um we actually went over a year without seizures and then we started the on fee or no, I'm sorry. The on fee was what put us seizure free. Okay. Um, and then we changed her food and I think we shocked her body a little bit with some changes mm -hmm. and I think she had a growth spurt. Um, and then she started seizing again in February okay. and that's when they started the Depakote and the Ficompa. Okay. And we're down to a couple, she's gone a month in between seizures, and then she's gone like a couple weeks in between seizures. We've actually been dealing with them today. Okay. Okay, yeah. So, so here's some input from someone else who tried Ficompa. Um, the this, this second person tried for compass that Onfi anecdotally helped, I, Onfi helped them a good deal. And, and that's something that I heard same, same here. And that's something we heard very frequently uh, from the girls who came from the study that Onfi seemed to be one of the more effective and helpful medications. Awesome. Thank you everybody for all your input.
any, oh, let's see. And here we have input, de the depakote lamictal synergy was key for us. And so this is a family that has actually, of all the girls, has really uh, probably the best seizure control. Okay. And so, um, so before we wrap up, uh, anybody have any last minute? Uh, is there a, is there a way to know what number our child is? Is question. Um, yeah. So, so certainly, um, if you, uh, I can, I'll open it back up, uh, and uh, and I can tell you the the the, quite the scheme. Um, so with the pictures. Um, so uh, so the way they're numbered are one through five across the top. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Oh, I missed one. Sorry, my chat was um, so six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Um, and then if you uh, made note of what number your daughter was, uh, here's the chart, and then you can see um, her, your daughter's number her variation, uh, her variant, whether it's de novo, the predicted effect, and then her X and activation studies. Without joining like, um, like a conference or something like that, how do we get that kind of information to you about our ch children? Um, so, um, so I would be delighted to hear more information about um, about other girls so we can try and pull together a bigger group. Um, so I'd be delighted to hear you can, if you're on the Facebook group, um, you can uh, tag me that way. I'm a member in the group. Um, or you can, I'm wel you're welcome to email me information. Um, I can be reached at kwb at jhmi.edu. So kwb at jhmi.edu. Okay. Give, give us, a, we'll give everyone another minute or two if, in case there are any last minute questions. Okay. Um, so can I get just some general feedback um, in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of how you felt the webinar went? Uh, was this useful to you all? Do you feel that you learned more about your daughters from this? Okay, good. I, I get some comments. Very helpful. Uh, yes, very useful. Fantastic. I'm so glad to hear that. Um, useful. I just wish I knew what I'm treating at this point. Right. Sure. Um, well, one last question. Uh, this is a good one. How far are we from a cure in your opinion? Um, I am very hopeful that within your daughter's lifetimes, we will have some sort of therapy that can impact the SMC1A expression um, that will improve their function and improve their epilepsy. Uh, so we, we know that for some disorders, uh, when the gene doesn't function, the, you know, so for example, there's some disorders where, for example, a brain malformation, where if someone has a mutation that affects how the brain is developing in the womb, it doesn't matter down the road if that gene is fixed by gene therapy. You know, so the brain will always look the same um, in terms of its structure. So for these disorders, um, including Rett syndrome, uh, you know, Angelman syndrome, these disorders where we know that we can impact function by control of gene transcription, um, I think they're, they're going to be much more amenable to these strategies. And so I think it's going to take a lot of... Um, the power of groups like your Facebook group in terms of uh, organizing, uh, you know, groups of patients with the same disorder, um, and uh, and uh, also advocating for your daughters, and also you know fundraising um, in terms of being able to offer grants to researchers uh, to interest them in your girl's disorder and potential exploring potential treatments. Okay, and so Francesca says that we at the foundation just want to thank you all for joining us here. We are going to try and get this up on the website next week. Is everyone 
oh, is everyone okay with us putting it up on the CDLS website, foundation website? So certainly if, uh, if anyone has any objections uh, or any concerns about this being uh, freely available, please share those with us. You can email me after the fact, um, but otherwise this can be available for you to go back and review or for people who couldn't join us today.